You know, I think it's really good that people have a big goal at the end of it. But remember that when you get to that point, you're going to take a step back and look back and be like, dang, I should have been a little easier on myself. Because a lot of times when you put too much immense pressure, you kind of self-sabotage. Oof, that's a good question. Well, I'll, I'll tell you right now, it was not easy. Oh my God, everybody from me to all my beloved ones suffered, right? You want to be built from the ground up. You want to have strong legs. You want to have a big, like not big, but like functioning body. Um, that's also good for like anti-arthritis, joint, uh, any joint related pains, um, dysfunctions in the future where you're starting to compensate load from the wrong areas. Oh gosh, yo, I love this question, dude. I haven't thought of this in over a year. Well, since last year, it's like Ramadan. Yo, on Eid, it's a big celebration for us Muslims, of course, but what do we do that day? If there is someone alive or dead that you would invite for dinner and have a conversation with, who would it be? Salam friends, welcome to Hazawi Podcast where we explore the world of Muslim artists and creators. This is your host Muhammad Morshed and I'm happy to come back with an episode with my friend Naveed who is a personal trainer, a bodybuilder, a mental health coach and a motivational speaker. In this conversation we covered Naveed's bodybuilding journey, mental health, the car accident that changed his life perspective and coaching techniques, how to prepare and enjoy Ramadan and much more. Naveed is filled with positive energy to the rim and Regardless of the struggles and challenges he faced, he was able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I hope you enjoyed this one. In the meantime, sit back and listen and salam. Naveed, thank you so much for coming on and Hazawi Podcast. I'm very, very happy to see you here today. I'm honored, brother. Thank you for the invite. Oh man, uh, it's been a long time. I've been thinking about inviting you for a very, very long since I started, but I'm like, all right, let me get all the tweaks in and make all the mistakes before I invite this brother because I know it's, it's going to be a good conversation. <laughs> I'm honored, bro. Thank you. I wondered, just because of your personal trainings and from the day I met you, you were all, all about like going to the gym and being fit and exercising. Uh, I was wondering who turned on the lights for you? Was it a person that you met that started your training journey or a book that you read? Um, it, was probably, it was probably my father, I want to say, because my dad was very active and he was fit since he was young. And he's been like the only dude... Until this day, the only guy that has been working out. So I have a picture of my dad when we were in like, when I was in eighth grade, going to prom and he was just flexing. I was like, dang, dad, you got it like that. You know what I mean? He hadn't been working out for what, 13 years, but he just had the, the development, right? So I remember when I went to high school and a friend told me, hey, you want to call me to plan fitness? I told my father and I've never seen my dad so giddy and excited. And uh, from that day forth, he pretty much signed me up for the gym and that's where history started. It started from my father because I've never seen him that like excited for me to do anything like that. And when, when, when did that start? At what age did you start going to the gym? Working out, working out. I want to say uh, 16, 17. But before that, I was boxing too. So it was, uh, boxing isn't good when you're that scrawny. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I remember this post that you posted a long time ago where it's like a comparison photo of you when you were younger, like just a kid and later like this big humongous guy. And it uh, was about um, you like starting at like 97 pounds and becoming like a hundred and something pounds. Um, yeah. And it took you like six years. What would that journey like? Oh, that, that, that journey was, it was beautiful. And now that I look at it from retrospect, um, the journey was fun, man, because it was so good for my mental health and my, 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 my psyche that the time just flew by, but I always had a goal in mind. But the beauty of it was there was no set day to get to that goal. It was just enjoy the process. That's a, like an interesting concept about like enjoying the process as opposed to focusing on the goal. Because I feel like I go through that uh, sometimes too, where, you know, whether it's like this podcast or the newsletter that I run, like I want it to be somewhere where it's not right now. And I forget that there's the process that comes before the goal. I feel like everybody, um, especially nowadays, it's like we've been uh, brought up, which is like instant gratification, you know? And I feel like we gotta kind of take a step back and give ourselves the the props of, you know, we're really going through, through with this all the way. You know, I think it's really good that people have a big goal at the end of it. But remember that when you get to that point, you're going to take a step back and look back and be like, dang, I should have been a little easier on myself. Because a lot of times when you put too much immense pressure, you kind of self-sabotage. I always tell people, like, take things one day at a time. 
but always be consistent and be nice to yourself and then watch it flourish. But always believe in yourself too, because you don't want to have constant expectations of I should be this way by this time. If it doesn't happen, you'll get there eventually. But just have fun in the process, trust yourself and, you know, just keep working at it. Don't wait for it to just come into your lap. Do you remember a time where you were at that place where you were just trapped in um, not meeting your expectations or struggling with your self-belief? And what did you do to like overcome it? Uh, it when I was in um, from like high school to like college, when we were all like together in school. Right. I didn't have that at all. I think the only time I've had that was in uh, like 2019 to uh early no mid 2022 because i don't know if you know i got hit by a car like i got into a severe car accident you ain't know that i went oh am i, I, I on social private. media for no, no, a very you're long good, time you're maybe. good you're good okay. I, 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 kept, I kept it very private i don't um say anything but um essentially um 2019 i was uh i i was in a, on my car and then i got t-bone serious severely and it was like my car my car is a little honda right and I got hit by a Lincoln Town car. And those cars are like tanks. So it's like a kindergartner, Mike Tyson. From that incident, I've had severe permanent injuries. I can't even begin to explain. Like, I want to say I have um, three herniated discs on my neck, four herniated discs on my lower back to my um, my sacrum. My right shoulder was torn. My right hand was broken. My left hip was torn and my left knee was torn. So mm -hmm. from that, from that, from a guy that's been working out for years and never got injured. So all of a sudden this happening. And remember, I was never a guy that was like, what's the word I want to say? Like risk averse. Like I would avoid risk when I'm training. It was just for fun. Then it's like all of a sudden now you're dealt with this, all these injuries. And now you just don't know how to live life anymore. Everything hurts. Like I remember I would walk to my job limping. There was days while I was training people. I was literally just sitting on a chair with my leg out because I couldn't bend it. So that time period was probably where I had the most struggle, mental health crisis through the roof because I just opened up my own gym. And it was literally the weekend I opened my gym. That's when it happened. So like that was it. And just coming to the realization that I'll never be the same again. Obviously now, alhamdulillah, like I'm at a way better place with my body than ever because I like the thicker build. I don't like the, the rip look because I was really skinny because it forced my metabolism to slow down with the depression and everything. So um, just getting myself from I'm broken to I can never work out to I'm broken, I can work out well, I just won't be perfect all the time. That was the hardest transition. And uh, alhamdulillah, like, yo, we've, if, I could, if I could go into more of that later, I will. But like, I've done things I never thought I would have done, even if I was uninjured. And it made me so much better at my job. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you went through that experience. It's, it must I'm, be very traumatic. I'm so grateful it happened. Wallah, like I don't regret it one bit. If I could have stopped it, I wouldn't because it made me so much better at my job. It made me understand like psychology, therapy, all these amazing things. And it, I went from my business to being just about training, being healthy, the mental positivity of it to now all I do mainly is pain relief and pain related work. Like you got guys that are coming into my space that are injuries from their neck all the way down to their toes. I'm talking knee issues, shoulder issues hip issues, spinal issues, um, athletes with X amount of injury, scar tissue development, people that are, I have one client that is uh, missing a leg. Like he had a prosthetic leg and all his weight shifted onto one side and it created scoliosis. Because of my injuries, I've been able to expand my horizon where I have like 30 articles ready to be published. Like all I do is specialize in pain. Like right now I'm talking to a girl that her needed her discs and she couldn't walk and she's been in pain for years. Within two sessions, she's just like starting to understand what's going on with her body. That's what I teach. It's not just, oh, work out, blah, blah, blah. No, it's like understand what's going on with your body. Now that you understand why this is happening, be aware of it, and then we'll take care of it slowly. So it's changed my whole business model to a different um, navigation. But I think it's a navigation we all need because everything nowadays is just so saturated with just work out, work out, work out. How about the people that are hurt that can't do what you got to do, but they're able to do it, but they just need that first couple weeks to months to rehabilitate and that's where i come in so yeah i'm blessed i'm blessed that, that's amazing and um i like when i have when i have a an image of you in my mind it's always i always come back to this very moment where we were in like city college and we were at the gym we we don't work out together but sometimes we would like cross paths and like we will work out at the same time and i remember you like just walking around the gym smiles 
all over uh, the smiles like stretch on your face and like literally walking towards people and telling them how like fix your form this is how you do this and it wasn't it wasn't like sabotaging or like it didn't it didn't feel that you were crossing like their line but it felt like you were uplifting them there is like one word to like describe you for me is like an overflow of positivity um yeah. Yeah. and like it's amazing that you took that experience of like you getting hit by a car and turned it even though like you had to go through the mental health and like the depression phase but you you were able to turn it and do something positive what is the process to do that like how do you materialize that in like in your head and like turn it into action Ooh, that's a good question well I'll, I'll say right now it was not easy oh my god everybody from me to all my beloved ones suffered in terms of like how I was acting, right? Because you're going through grief, um, acceptance, all the waves, right? But I guess um, the best way to say it is like, after I overcame everything and I started studying more, my I can't I can't say the same for a lot of other people, but my job gives me so much joy and happiness that that was probably the only thing that was keeping me going. Does it make sense? My job was literally. I work with the best people. I work with such nice and kind souls. And me trying to be a better version of me, I kept on thinking of them. Like if I could be a better coach, how could I do it? All right, let me get myself out of this negative downward spiral. Maybe if I started doing a little bit of movement, I can understand how they feel when they do certain things. Because think about it. I'm a trainer that's training people that hasn't worked out for two plus years now. I can only go things off based off memory and science, not I'm not in the pool with you. And then, you know, as I started getting better at my craft in terms of pain, uh, pain work, um, I started realizing, wow, like my story can relate to a lot of people that might not have that same hope. Think about it. We're all comparing. Well, comparison is a thief of all joy, but sometimes you can't help it, especially with social media. Right. So everybody's just seeing these fit people or what everybody thinks is fit. Right. So they feel bad because if they feel like they're, handicaps in their movement. How can I do this? How can I do that? So that's where I realized, wow, maybe I could be a voice of reason for them to have some hope. Because if me, my broken butt can do this, I definitely know you can. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's been the biggest thing that as I, as I started becoming more of the case where people were like, wow, you really went through all that and you're doing all this. So that was the biggest motivator when I started seeing people that really didn't feel like they could move well, then they're looking at me and they're like, wow, I'm not as bad as that. And then that gave them hope. And then they believed in themselves and then they start having their success. You talked about like expanding your horizon in terms of like your training methods and as opposed to just focusing on the body and building up the physique, there is this mental health um, to it. How you translate that into your gym? I guess we'll go from mental health. I've realized that when you're active, and you're you are physically moving, you're in a lot better mood, right? And I could realize and I could say so many other stories about like how there's so many guys that I know that have such easy jobs where they work only two hours throughout the day, but yet they're the one that are saying that they don't have enough time to do X, Y, and Z. So the movement part is always uh, scientifically proven to be better for you. You need movement in your life to be happy, right? You get people that are in different places in their life, um, mentally and also like physically. And how do you differentiate and be able to serve them and customize their own, you know, to get them from point A to a point. Good way of phrasing that. Um, so mental health comes first because if your mind is saying no, there's no way I can help you, right? So my, my coaching belief is always have get, be that light, be that positive reinforcement, right? One of the biggest things they taught me when I was in nutrition uh, school was um, uh, your environment really creates how much progress you're going to have right? In terms of your internal battles outside of wherever your gym is, right? So essentially, uh, you gauge how their mindset is, and you tell them that you'll be their support system. And honestly, you have to run by and educate them on what proper movement is. So they're not jumping the gun. Oh, why am I not doing this? But this person is doing this, right? And then you slowly start to teach them. And then when they finally get the movement down, that's essential for basic human movement, and it's proper loading mechanics and then they first do their workout they're like whoa that felt way better and then when they start to increase their load capacity they're like wait is this supposed to be this quick i'm like no but when you're doing it right it is does it make sense <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. just it's just like when people hit that threshold of i can't do it anymore or that's my limit 
if they're not seeing like honestly like a professional they really know the insights of human anatomy and the proper mechanics of the body that threshold will feel almost impossible to overcome because your body is only working within its comfort limits right like but when your body moves as a whole unit it grows as a whole unit does it make sense and that's essentially what i teach to meet to make people move as a whole as opposed to pieces which is a lot harder because when you're training just for like looks or aesthetics it's just mm, 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 you know what i mean but people don't realize when you're just doing this all day this is starting to develop while all this is starting to be atrophied right and that's why boxers and athletes move a certain way. And that's why guys that just go to the gym and just work out look a certain way. You mentioned how there are, you know, people who work only two hours a day and there are people who work, you know, all day, but there is a necessity, like there, it is very necessary for people to get their body moving that contribute to their like overall happiness. For someone who's very, very busy, works maybe a nine to five, has a family, how do they build the workouts, the training into their schedule? That's a very good question. I have this conversation all the time. When it comes to if you're in a position in your life where, because a lot of it is lifestyle based, right? Um, if you're in a position where you just have a newborn or your, your partner is going through something, prioritize that over everything, right? The gym can wait. But if your life is pretty much set in stone and everything's repetitive and you know what to expect the next day, you got to really map out your day on a calendar, right? Fill it up as much as you can. You got to run errands, you got to drive to work, you got work, you got to do this and the third. And you'll start to see these little white spaces, right? And I have trained a whole um, range like of people in different uh, jobs and everybody has white spaces. That's where you fill in the gym. Of course, if you're short on time, you can't do as much as the guy that has more time, right? But it doesn't actually take a lot to be healthy, right? You got to make sure you're sleeping good. You got to eat good and just get a little bit of movement in. You'd be surprised how much 30 minutes to an hour can do, but it's not going to feel like that the first couple of times. But if you're doing it for a month straight, you'll feel that difference. So it's just finding that white space and taking advantage of it. But it has to come from the discipline because if you're not disciplined with your time, you're not going to take it serious. You're big on using calendar and filling up the white spaces. And I, I, I do the same just because the nature of like the work I do and the multiple projects I handle. Um, what other tools or apps do you use to either make sure that you're hitting your to-do list or organizing the, all the tasks that you have to do for your personal, your business? I, I love that question because I get asked that all the time. Everybody asks me that. Um, and and I'm only speaking from a person that's an accountant, a, a janitor, a, a business owner, a guy that has so many bills and family responsibilities. I'm only saying this from experience. I use Google Calendar for everything. I look at all my clients, any meetings I have with like a mentor, this amazing podcast, any future events. I have a time where I schedule where I look through my emails to clutter up if I'm missing anything. Um, my workouts, my breaks, right? And my favorite one of all is, I'm not sure if you have an iPhone or an Android, but that Siri function to create reminders. Example, if I'm talking to a client and they say, hey, Navid, I need help with this and the third. Okay, I got 10 clients today. I can't do that. Hey, Siri, set a reminder for this and the third at this time. And then as soon as that time hits, I already know. So it's not in here. I don't have to remember nothing. It's already on paper. That way, if that reminder thing is empty and my checklist and to-do list with Google Calendar is empty, I can show peacefully without going to bed overthinking what's what I got to do. I love it. I don't use the reminder app. I use this app called Todoist. Um, uh -huh. That's T-O-D-O-I-S-T. And it sort of has the same function where it creates to-do uh, to -do lists and that you can break them into different categories. It's a little bit more complicated than just a simple reminder. I feel like reminder has less friction uh, but 100%. this one is a this one ha is a little bit more complicated but once you get to the flow of it and you get used to it then it becomes a very helpful tool and like i have it basically set up on like my, my home screen and like i can click it and add or oh, like on the weekend i have to drop off books at the library or i have to pick up um this thing with the, from the supermarket whatever so that it doesn't live in my mind because i am that person where like if i put myself to bed 
everything that I didn't do will like come to me. Uh, and then I have to think about it and it like clutters my mind. I, I'm on the same boat. I'm pretty sure your app also does a thing where, because I've seen apps like that where that shows what takes more priority than others. That's the, the type of thing that you're doing. But I try to keep, live a very simple, simple life. So priorities are not getting too crazy unless like pay your bills or anything of that nature. People should work out or should be in uh, in the gym based on like their, their schedule and their white spaces. I'm wondering what that looks like in terms of frequency. Is it two times a month? Is it like two two times a week? Is it three times a week? What does that look like? You got to experiment, of course, right? But um, I always tell people there's a big change in stress adaptation from two times a week of training to three times a week. Anything, I, I believe if you could do anything above three, that's amazing. So three and up is great. That's like the magic number in my book. And do they look like different trainings? Uh, is it, you know, cardio oh, or is it lifting? I, what does it look I, like? I always, I always tell people, um, first of all, if you've never really prioritized movement, right? The first time you do it, you're going to see amazing results. Does it make sense? Because that yeah. change, that stress is so foreign to you. But as you get more comfortable with training and movement, you start to see what you prefer more of. Some people like anaerobic, some people like strength, some people like yoga, right? But I would say you should always have a good mixture of things. But one of the biggest things is also is make sure you're doing your cardiac health because maybe you don't feel that now when you're young, but that's going to play a big role when you're older, right? And your strength because it also creates – remember, we're like trees, right? You want to be built from the ground up. You want to have strong legs. You want to have a big – like not big, but like functioning body. Um, that's also good for like anti-arthritis, joint, uh, any joint-related pains. Um, dysfunctions in the future where you're starting to compensate load from the wrong areas. So it's, you're looking at it more for like you're improving, you're sacrificing X amount of hours a week, but you're improving the longevity and the quality of the life you will have now and onward. Ramadan is around the corner. Ooh. And uh, I feel like that's a topic that we, like the Muslim community has an emphasis around um, spirituality and how do you gain that spiritual uplifting in, in Ramadan? How do you go inward and sort of cover the gaps that have grown over the course of the year? And I think that's very, very healthy. There is less focus on like your physical health. You know, if Tar comes, you break your fast and people just like shove everything down their throat and then come to the masjid. Um, what tips do you have in preparation before Ramadan? How does meal prep and look in Ramadan? Preparations I would tell anybody for Ramadan is just be prepared for what you your life has. Like be prepared that whatever things you have to do in your normal day without food, right? But the thing is that I'll tell you as a as a as a as a Muslim brother that has a lot of non-Muslim friends, I've had many people try Ramadan, and they don't say it's hard, but it's hard because they don't have the discipline to keep it going. For us, we fear Allah, right? So we do it without that initial, oh, I'm just trying it. No, it's a part of our duty as a Muslim to do this. Does it make sense? So I always just tell people just like, you know, just be prepared for whatever your job is that you are mentally going to be doing this and take the precautions around tailoring if you're, you could do something for your work just to make things a little bit easier on you. If you're working at home or if you have to commute far, let your office know, see if they can tailor something where you could do things a little bit less stressful. Or if you have a job that's very labor intensive, let them know for about a month, you're going to be a little out of it and you won't be as productive. Does it make sense? Because yeah. a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of companies and stuff, they don't know what Ramadan really is. Cause I tell some, a lot of my clients are not Muslim and I tell them like, Oh, Ramadan's coming. They're like, okay. Um, and then the first thing they say, no water. I'm like, yeah, no water, no nothing, <laughs> <laughs> no medication either. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I would tell them, um, in terms of like the eating and stuff, I always tell people like, listen, if you're already trying to be fit, you'll find a way to do it. Right. But Ramadan, the biggest thing I tell people is the beauty of that month for all of us Muslims. Well, the biggest thing is you should prioritize your deen. Does that make sense? Deen first. I hear people talking more about health. I'm going to lose weight this and the third more than the deen. Take advantage of the D, man. That's like overtime for Islam's for good deeds. You know what I'm trying to say? Take advantage of that, right? Um, but in terms of like the health stuff, um, it's so good for our insulin. America, Americans overeat like crazy. Our food are very processed, so our insulin's always fluctuate. That's why we create 
we gain weight at such a rapid rate. You know what I mean? So take advantage of that insulin drop. Because think about after Ramadan, you're less hungry throughout the day, right? In the beginning. Then later on, you get back into your old habits and then, right? So I always tell people like, for Ramadan, just take advantage of the, the fact that your insulin will naturally drop. Be aware of what you're eating because let's say you're literally nutritious to deprived. You're going to eat oily, saturated, bad food as your replenishment. Let's just think about this if we were surviving in the real world, right? Eat food, be mindful of it because you will feel that afterwards. How many times do we just eat with an empty stomach and then we're like sluggish and we can't move in? Or prayer is like really hard, right? So be mindful of what you eat. Have some self-control, but don't have too much expectations. I'm going to change my whole life around. And then two weeks later, you're worse than before in terms of your health, right? In terms of myself, what I do for Ramadan, I don't really have much of an appetite, right? I'm on the slim side genetically and naturally, so I don't really crave food too much throughout Ramadan. But my biggest thing is I want to maintain the weight that I have. So a lot of it is going to be eating throughout the job hours and um, obviously because I'm going to be working at night, right? And just a lot of protein and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, are there things that people should be avoiding during Ramadan or eating less of? Uh, to whether whether to maintain their weight or even to lose weight? Um, they, they should definitely avoid, as I said, oily and fried foods, um, even though that is delicious, right? Um, just as I said, like think about the long run of things, right? If that's all you had to eat. Would you just eat that? It's not going to come mm-hmm. good. Um, just eat real food and um, don't overindulge and... Uh, Keep your body moving because as soon as you eat, you want to go to sleep. That's actually breaking the, 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 the insulin and the weight loss stuff. You want to be active. You want to try to maintain things. It's only the only thing that I would say is a little tough, at least speaking from an American, is um, the discipline. Because America keeps going on and it just happens to be Ramadan. Where in other countries, it's Ramadan first. Everything revolves around Ramadan. Does it make sense? So yeah. that, that, that's, why, that's why I try to tell like a lot of Americans, like, just be mindful the way, how amped up you are on day one, you will definitely not be in day 15. I have a friend who fasted Ramadan with me a couple of years ago, and he enjoyed it. And uh-huh. this, this year, he's, pla- he's, uh, he's planning to fast it as well. Um, so I'm very excited because like even last Ramadan, I would like tell him, uh, um, uh, I think it wasn't last Ramadan, it was maybe two Ramadans ago. Um, like I would tell him like avoid fried food, try to have like clean meals, uh, drink a lot of water after the, you break your fast. Um, and the more you do it, it, it gets easier and your energy levels changes. And tell me, tell me if this, if this happens to you too. Um, for me, the first maybe day or two are, are, are tough. Then I just go on cruise control. But then what the amazing thing that happens to me in Ramadan is that my, my energy level, I can I can feel them. Like I will start in the morning, they're high. And like they decrease very, very slowly and consistently. Like by the end of the Correct. day, I'm, I'm tired. Um, but then during all Ramadan season, my energy, like I just spikes. Like in the morning, I'm like up here, and then I eat lunch, and like I want to go to sleep. How to balance your energy levels uh, throughout the day, especially for someone who works at an office, and like you eat and you go back to your seat, and like that's like the perfect condition to take a nap. Well, well one thing is like I think Ramadan would probably be best for people that are in the in the office shop, right? Because it's low maintenance work. You're not moving too much throughout the day, at least, and. I, I, I'm pretty sure you can agree with me on this. You're more sharper in oh, Ramadan. Yeah. 100%. You're, 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 there's less declutter and fogging here, and you're more sharper. The only time that really doesn't work is if you had a really unregular day before. Like you didn't, you barely ate sahur or, you know, but I think it's actually perfect for people that have a, a job where they're sitting down and they just got to be mentally focused. And I, the reason being is because your body has, um, your body starts to use different energy systems that naturally would take a lot longer to get to. That's why it, your like your uh, glucose and everything goes up when you eat, and then it just crashes down slowly, and then you eat again, boom, boom, boom. And then with Ramadan, it's like you have one in the morning, and then throughout your day, your body. That's why it hurts. It's it's so difficult in the beginning and like the first couple of days, and then later it just goes to cruise control because your body has adapted to this. Okay, I understand what's going on. I'm not getting 
enough food throughout the day. I got to maximize whatever I have right now. What do you what do you do after Ramadan? You've gone through this month of fasting. Your body has gotten used to a certain way of, of um, basically basically using your energy levels. What do you do after Ramadan so that you don't shock the system and you maintain that energy? Oh, gosh, yo, I love this question, dude. I haven't thought of this in over a year. Well, since last year, it's like Ramadan. Yo, on Eid, it's a big celebration for us Muslims, of course. But what do we do that day? We overindulge. At least I could say from like my community and like like my culture, like people, we overly eat the day after Ramadan. Everybody's house we go into. Oh, I got to eat this much or it's disrespectful. Do you not see how that just sets us up for failure? It's like, like your whole life you've been drinking one like one sip of Coke. And then all of a sudden on the last day before you're about to be Coke free, you just chug like two gallons, right? That throws you off instantly. So what I tell people is when it's eating time, um, be aware of what's going to happen. If you know you're going from houses to houses, small portions every time. And you got to set the boundary with the people that are around you. Like, listen, I'm eating a little bit. I'm trying to keep this up because we all know that next morning when you had a crazy eat, you are very tired from all the moving around, all the families and friends. So your, 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 your social, your social batteries kind of down. Then you just knock out with all that in your system and you wake up the next morning and nothing really happened. It has become a tradition in my household where, um, like, so my, my brother's married and I'm married and like, uh, me, him, my sisters who are, who are also married, we always gather at my mom's apartment um, to have breakfast together on the day of Eid. And nice. it's so consistent and it's crazy how consistent it is. And we try to avoid it every year, but we can't. Where we gather there and we eat big breakfast, Yemeni uh, beans. I mean, like, it's amazing. But then we're yeah. like, after, after this breakfast, we'll go out to the park, take pictures, whatever. Literally every single year, we will all knock out on the couch, on the floor, on the beds. Everybody just yep, out. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have the same tradition with my mother. Like um, every uh, every uh, Eid, um, I'll either sleep over at my mom's house or I'll go to her place, right? And I'll wake up with this traditional breakfast. I don't know what Bengalis call it. I'm barely holding on to the Bengali culture myself. But it's like this orange rice. I can't remember what it was called. And when I eat that, that signifies the seed. I told my mom, don't make it any other time of the year. I think it's called Jorda. And then when I eat that, because it's literally like oiled up, as soon as I eat it, I'm already on the couch napping out. My dad wakes me up, wudu, time to go pray. Oh, man. So we already, you already see what's happening. Yeah. We're setting yeah. ourselves up for it. I wanted to go back to. Um, this concept of and like I feel it now too as we having this conversation, which is like you you are a very positive person about life, and I've always known you to be that, but I also know that you grew up in a very very tough environment, and uh, you did not have like a easy life um, as a kid. Yeah, and I'm always wondering how that journey affected. The, who you are, how did you turn um, all the thing that you grew I, up with to a positive uh, being that you are? You, you know what's hilarious? Like sometimes I'll talk to my clients and they love me to death and I love them too. And I literally tell them like, yo, like if I didn't have the gym or anything, I swear, I, I remember I didn't even want to go to college. I swear I would end up in jail or something. Honest to God. Like um, it's a lot of, essentially I'll, I'll put it this way. The gym saved me from the streets in the sense of I would go to the gym right after school instead of going to the park or the hood because every time we go to the hood, it'd be real fun, but we'd be doing some dumb stuff, right? Like, I'm, I'm very straightforward with a lot of the stuff that I did. Like, we'd be trying to take people's cell phones, always getting into fights nonstop. It's funny because yesterday my boy reverted. Yeah, I saw my that. Brother. I saw that on your Instagram. Yeah. And my, my, my brother literally was telling his friend that met me, like, Yo, like he was just like, I was like, I like this giddy dude, like really nice Muslim brother, which I am. He was just like, yo, nah, son, you don't know Navi back in the day, throwing it up with everybody, the only brown dude. And then it was just like laughing because I'm like, yeah, this is where, it's funny how this, how people perceive me now. And back in the day, they, that's all they knew of me. And then now they just can't even imagine it. Right. So I'll say like the gym saved me a lot in the sense of it kept me grounded. Um, I would 
I would not go hang out with my friends. I would just go to the gym instead. So it kept me very disciplined with that type of stuff. Um, um, the reason this is a very, 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 my favorite answer, and it comes from the heart, and I tell people this all the time. People ask me all the time, why are you so happy? Why are you so positive? This and the third. And I say the same time. You can ask anybody that knows me. I say this. Every day I live right now is a dream. If you were to ask me when I was 16, 17 years old, what will my future be? When I was thinking of that, I was thinking I was working at CVS part time. I would have like a roommate. I would take the bus everywhere. I didn't have high expectations of life. I was never a smart kid. Um, none of that. Right. So I was just like, life is just going to be whatever. I was always the ch I was always the kid in my family with all my cousins. I was uh, not the most smartest in terms of books. I think I have the best people skills and awareness skills, but just books where in my community and family, books and grades are everything I lacked. So I didn't have a lot of expectations of life and I would work these whack jobs and I just don't know how life came to the point where I have, I'm, I'm a homeowner, I have my own car, I have my own business, I have people that love me to death. Um, like I'm the light of other people, which is amazing. I have a business that has a, a wait list of 100 plus people with zero advertising. Like, I just don't know how this all happened. And it's all happened because one, sum one summer, I, I don't know if I told you this, but one summer, it was my second time I almost killed. So I already got stabbed. I, this time I almost got um, shot at. And the bullet just missed my shoulder because my boy that was running with me that was going to get shot, the dude pointed at him. And I was right next to him, like an idiot. He was running right next to me. So when the dude would, pop, I felt the bullet like literally like almost hit me. You could feel it. It was crazy because it was like a seven on six brawl. And then that's when I told my cousin and my cousin took me to the mushy. And that's when I went and uh, I embraced and understood Islam. And that that following year was my senior year of high school. I was wearing the cool feet in one of the most worst schools in Queens Everybody started calling me the Muslim big homie because big homie is a status that you give to a dude that's in a gang that has a lot of power. And life has really taken on from there. From that, my one of my closest friends, she became Muslim and she was a very religious girl. The guy that's my, my gang leader, he became Muslim. So everybody that starts to understand Islam and looks at Islam in a different light, they usually go to me first from the hood. Because they see me, what I was doing from the beginning, and alhamdulillah, every success that I've ever had, I contributed to Allah in my mother's prayers. So that's where, that's why I'm so happy. Like, I don't deserve any of this. Zero. I don't deserve nothing. But that's why when you guys saw me at the masjid, and I finally found brotherhood, um, because my definition, my brothers, to my, till this day, are my brothers, right? But can I say they've done a lot since I have last seen them? Not really. So when I went to the masjid and I met brothers like all the ones that we had, it reminded me of the brothers that I met when I first took Islam seriously in, at the end of 11th grade. Like, wow, but you guys are my age now. You guys are on reverts. And we are all here for the fear of Allah, the oneness of Allah. And we got each other's back. And people don't understand, like, with Islam, like, you got your brothers back because y'all both love God. But when you were in the streets... You got each other's back because of a gang. But if something like money or drugs come into play, you'll think twice. But when it's with God, there ain't no other thinking. You know what I mean? And that loyalty is different. I tell all my brothers that from the streets. They understand to a certain extent. But when they, if they ever decide to pick up the Quran or understand Islam, they'll know what's up. Because a lot, like one of the main reasons my OG became Muslim was because a lot of his family members, when they was coming up, of, up top from jail, they became Muslim. And then he started researching it, and then he's like, oh, wow. And then he met, and then me and him, we got closer throughout the years, and I started telling him about more and more, and then boom, he gave a shahada. So it's like, Islam is the truth, my brother. We blessed. We was born this stuff, and I tell everybody, like, yo, we're blessed, but there's other brothers that are so stuck in the loop of their life that they can't understand. They, they don't have time to understand it. So at least if they can see you and the way you act and why you act that way, let it be because it be Islam, straight up. My culture doesn't determine who I am. My ethnicity being like my parents from Bangladesh, I don't care about that. I'm a Muslim first and always. I feel like if if um I feel like one thing that people misunderstand is I'm a very straightforward, disciplined person. So people that have 
insecurities or people that love to badmouth people. They speak ill of others because they're hiding things that they're insecure about of themselves. So a lot of people talk bad on me and saying, um, I'm cocky, I'm arrogant, I'm egotistical. When anybody that knows me knows that's not what I'm not at all, like zero. And I could say that because I study myself. I'm a very calm, quiet person. So that's the only thing that people misunderstand because I'm very, I guess I'm a stern person and I love very little in the sense of I love the people that are around me because I used to be the type that loved everybody, but then I drained my battery and the people that did love me didn't get enough attention. You remember how I was in um, college. Now I've realized, you know, the people that are around me take care of them first and then worry about other people that are not directly in your life later. So I feel like that's the only one thing. But other than that, I'm very happy. I, whatever people misunderstand me for or don't understand, it's okay. Because the people that do matter, they know me well and they 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 support me. So I'm blessed, just like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I try to be that loving person to other people as well and like just bring um as much positive energy to my surroundings as possible and i feel like i'm also like very jaded uh, in terms of like who i not only like invite into like my life but i don't seek like new circles or like new friends um and like we live in a, in a especially like i want to be a writer i know i'm be i know i want to write books and like that's the dream um and like there's all this like push for you to like make connections and but i'm like I already have the people that I need in my life. And like more than that, I, it just feels overwhelming. Um, and this is even, even when I invite people to, to the podcast, like I want to make sure that I invite people that I really enjoy having conversations with, as opposed to like people who will make this podcast grow or make me famous. Because if I'm not enjoying those conversations and learning, then like, there's no point. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I agree with you, bro. You said, you said everything you just said, I'm on the same wavelength, honest to God. When people say, yo, you have to network. I'm just like, I'm good though. Like I love where I'm at. <laughs> um, that's a good and a bad thing because we're very content and we're very happy with what we have right now. But in terms of the growth and the opportunity, we're limiting ourselves a little. Yeah. But we're happy nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> um what would you what would your advice be for uh young Muslims who want to start training, start working out at the gym? Um, where do they start? My advice for Young Muslims, because I just gave a speech, I don't know, saw two, two weeks ago in Brooklyn at, uh, I can't remember which uh, mosque, but it was like, I was talking to kids about the same thing. Just start anywhere. Don't have super high expectations. Don't compare yourself to the people on online. Do what feels right for you. Listen to your body and take training and the beauty of the discipline that you get from it and the mental focus you get from it because it'll keep you sharp. It'll keep you away from a lot of the haram stuff because everything is just being thrown onto you. And the more confidence you have within yourself, the more confidence and things you can fight from the outside world that's trying to corrupt your deen. What is one book that you've recommended the most to people? It's a book that I've read multiple times. I've given this book out as gifts. That's how good they are. It's called How to Set Boundaries and Fight Peace by Nindra Glover Tawab. I butchered my name. Sorry. It's one of the best books I've ever read. Do you want to ask, do you want me to explain why? Sure. I feel like people have a very hard time understanding boundaries, and especially for myself as a guy that's very quiet, you tend to think the worst. But you not having boundaries essentially ruin your quality of life because you're giving it to others and it doesn't let you un and you don't know how to perceive situation situations because your brain starts to think of the worst case scenario, which is most likely not going to be. So this book teaches a lot about how to find peace within yourself and how to um, handle other situations in the real world that if you don't take care of, it'll come back to bite you in the butt, whether it will be consequences or anxiety. Mm -hmm. So phenomenal book. And another book I would recommend, I know you didn't ask, is The Compound Effect. Um, one of my friends recommended it to me. He literally, he went from working at Best Buy, making X amount of salary to having multiple real estate investments all over the country. Nothing special. He took his investments, budgeted everything down to the T, and he just made this all happen. No luck, just all hard work. And he recommended this book. I read this book one time, but that one time was enough because it pretty much teaches you the benefits of keeping it going. Yeah. No procrastination, no slowing down. Just keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. 
And as I said, the compound effect. You save one dollar every day. Before you know it, at the end of the year, you have three sixty-five cash. Ooh, but you're not feeling that dollar, right? Yeah. So that book is a another good one. There's many books. I love books. I don't read them. I hear them because I have a hard time reading. But books are it. It teaches you the lessons that you need in life without having to go through it. But you're prepared for it. If there is someone alive or dead that you would invite for dinner and have a conversation with. Who would it be? Oof. I got like five people always. One of them happens to be my father. So <laughs> I have dinner with him right now. <laughs> um, I would say, I don't know if I could even say it a lot. Like Hazrat Umar Radiyallahu. Like that's, that's, that like, you already know, like talking about like his past and who he was to the man that he became. So much of his story. I remember I heard it when we were in that MSO together and I internalized and I felt a lot of it in my heart. Like, even though I was never a bad kid in the sense of I would actively harm people, it was just I was one way and it was the exact opposite of the way it should have been in life, right? And then, like, just this guy is like this big, tough guy, right? These are some of the things that why I also feel like I would relate to him. It's like he's this big, tough, stern dude, but any time a woman would come into the room, he'd get quiet, right? That's how I am, too, because I respect women and I try to, like, give space and everything, right? Like, that's the type of guy I want to be like when I think of, a strong Muslim, and that's one of my main role models. I could always look into, so I'm going to tell you anyways, I love Malcolm X, I love Muhammad Ali, I love Mike Tyson, but these brothers, I could already understand a lot of their psyche and stuff through books and interviews and podcasts or whatever it is, right? But with Hazrat Umar Radiran, who there's only that book or biography that they had, but I'd rather speak to him myself and speaking to a man that is so highly praised in Islam as uh, one of the uh, um, Khalifas, right? He, like, that would strengthen my deen even more on a level that I'll forget everything about this world and just focus on what the real mission is. Nabi, thank you so much for coming on Hazawi. I can't thank you enough. Uh, this was a All joy right. of a conversation to have. And uh, inshallah, we will come on and we talk again. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, bro. And then we get some food, man, because I miss you, bro. I haven't seen you in a very long time. <laughs> we should we should we should definitely meet and have like lunch together off camera and stuff because I feel like that would be um like going back to the time we spent in college together and um just like you know catching up. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, when you spoke about that gym memory, I literally just had like 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 so much like like a experience from that because I just remember like you know how sometimes the sun would come in through those windows yeah and we'd be coming straight from the MSO we'd see each other I remember it and it just gave me chills to think that was that long ago yeah it, Tom it's, 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 it's flying fast yeah but oh I'm always grateful for the brothers that I met including you bro and thank you for having me I'm honored I uh, you're you're you've been a great dude in totally conversation of being a genuine brother so I see no reason why you wouldn't be successful in this thank you so much we appreciate it inshallah <laughs> That's it for this episode in Hazawi Podcast. I hope you had the opportunity to gain valuable lessons and practical tips to use in your own life. Make sure you don't miss the next episode. Sign up to my newsletter. I'll link it below where I also send a weekly email with podcasts I'm listening to, movies I'm watching, quotes I'm pondering, uh, projects I'm working on, and other cool stuff. In the meantime, thank you for watching and or listening and stay creative. Salam.